This is Hester. This is Maria. Together we are the Consort Counselors. Today we would like to present you a few exercises to make sure that the final chord of a piece or of a phrase or of a section is absolutely impeccable. Yes, because the final chord of a piece is a crucial point and it's good to start your tuning exercises there because uh, the audience will remember the final chord and if this is not correct or if it's not very nice, actually the whole piece is destroyed. But when the final chords are getting more and more in tune, then actually like by magic the rest of the piece will also sound more and more in tune and you will get closer and closer in sound. Today we will work with an Almain by Anthony Holborn, uh, which is called The Choice. And we find this title very fitting to this topic and you will find out later why. Let's get started. And we have three lovely people to help us with this episode. Um, Filipa Pereira from Portugal. She also is a player of the Royal Wind Music. And we have Paul Schaumburg from Germany, recorder student at the Amsterdam Conservatoire. And Patricia Roa Johansen from Denmark, also a student in the block in Amsterdam. In early music, most final chords you are going to encounter will have a bass note. And on top of that, there will be an octave. And there will possibly also be a fifth. And there will possibly also be a minor or a major third. Most cases, actually, a major third. And when you are playing with more than four parts, or like today we are with five, then some of these functions, maybe they are even three times. For example, the bass note may be also doubled by two other players in different octaves. And there are all kinds of different combinations in which part these different functions will be. Why is it so important to know your function in the final chord and in any chord? Maybe you remember from our episode 3 about just intonation uh, that when two players play together, something magical happens. There will appear a different stone out of nowhere. And the great news is, all intervals in a major triad, in a major chord, will create the same different stone in one octave or the other. So for example, in G major, we will have a couple of extra Gs that no one plays, confirming the bass note of the chord. And that is why when a chord is played in tune, the chord sounds so buzzing and with a lot of core and with a good foundation. And when you play a chord out of tune, it sounds miserable and maybe also unbearable because the different tone doesn't match the chord. How can we fix such a terrible chord? Well, let's build it up and let's focus on the functions that we have. Let's first focus on the octave. So let's hear first the bass and on top of the bass comes an octave uh, on the fourth line and then also an octave on the top line. And each octave should think of themselves as being a sort of harmonic or a reflection of the bass. So uh, a little bit on the mild side and mixing into the existing sound. <laughs> continue and on top of the octaves we already have we are going to add now also the fifth. The fifth is a great helper for everyone else to check if they are really in tune and especially for the third to find the right mixture. So it's always a good idea to play the fifth especially in Renaissance music on the present side and uh, also very determined. So let's hear the bass, the octave and then and finally, we also add the major third. After all the intervals we already have, the major third uh, in this sort of tuning should be on the low side to be uh, really ringing and preferably also a little bit present. So don't think too soft, even though you have to play lower. Compensate with fingers and we see what happens. Now we can play the chord in 
tune. But our advice is never just tune chords. Always put them in a context. For example, let's add the penultimate chord of this piece to the final chord. In many cases, there is a shared pitch in the penultimate chord and uh, the final chord. In this case, we have D major and G major, and the shared pitch is a D. Again, great news, the D is played by the third line in the penultimate chord and also in the final chord. And this D should never change. The third line, in this case Patricia, has the D, which is going to be our anchor for the penultimate and the final chord. So how we're going to practice this is as follows. Patricia will play alone for one beat, and then all the rest of us will join on the next beat and play the penultimate chord. Then for one more beat we hear Patricia's D alone again, and then finally we all join for the final chord. In that way, we can relate everything to the D. Just a note about functions. Um, in the penultimate chord, the second line is playing the fifth, and this should feel rather proud and strong. And in the final chord, she, that is me, is playing the third, which feels rather low, but still strong. The fourth line plays the fifth in the penultimate chord, and then in the final chord, uh, he plays the octave. So it feels strong with a lot of tension, and then as a release, a little bit softer as an octave on top of the bass. We will now play the penultimate chord and the final chord together. And we are going to do so in the most convincing way we can. Because as our teacher Paul Lainhaus used to say, you make a choice and you stick with it. Remember, it is much better to be convincing and a little bit out of tune than the opposite. <laughs> that tuning should be in your physical memory. And we have a nice exercise for you that is called Chaos and Order. We are going to play for four beats, absolute rubbish, uh, nonsense, and then after four beats we play the penultimate chord, which is hopefully really nicely in tune, then Chaos and Nonsense and Rubbish, and then the final chord, very nicely in tune again. <laughs> To make sure that we share the same idea of motion and direction in the chord, we can also do another exercise, which is we play the penultimate chord and first we play it four times and in each bit we play pizzicato and then we play a long chord of four bits. Then we do the same with the final chord. So, to finish, let's put all of this into context and let's practice the final three bars of the piece and all our concentration goes especially to sharing direction, length and tuning on the final chord. Tuning is not just tuning. When you think of other elements in the music like fast air, good sound, good coordination, good direction, you will come quite far. Therefore, we want to add one more layer to it, and this is the mixing board. Because sometimes a chord can sound in tune, but the balance might not be ideal. So let's experiment with that. First, we are going to ask Patricia, the fifth, to play an even louder fifth. That's really as if you are the soloist of the ensemble and put yourself through. Uh, without changing the pitch, so adding a couple of fingers.
let's try also to do something special with the major third of the chord, which is on Hester's part. So if we keep this loud fifth of Patricia, then we can maybe give a special color with vibrato to the major third to have a slightly different color for the end. <laughs> step of today is for a fantastic vocal ensemble, the Welgas Ensemble, conducted by Paul van Nevel. They are a Flemish ensemble and they sing the most beautiful final chords ever. Listen to the recordings, listen to final chords, the length is perfect, the mixture is perfect, the tuning is perfect, perfect. We would like to encourage you to get addicted to tuning with your ensemble. Uh, make a chain of chords and get them perfectly in tune because it's such a nice thing to do and you will for sure get hooked to it Well, once you can do it. Good luck! Don't forget to subscribe and if you have questions or comments for us, contact us here. See you next time. Bye bye!